I'm Jane Alexander, Nantucket Book Festival alumna, welcoming you to At Home with Authors. The last time we spoke with Will Schwalbe at the 2017 Nantucket Book Festival, I told him that author Ryder Zebarth called him the nicest guy. He is the nicest guy you will ever meet. The nicest. Would you rather be known as the nicest guy or the greatest author? <laughs> wow, that's a tough question. You know, I would go with nicest guy. Will Schwalbe is author of the End of Your Life book club, which he formed with his mother, just the two of them, after she was diagnosed with terminal cancer. He then wrote Books for Living, about 26 books that have spoken to him at just the right moments. On this episode of At Home with Authors, nice guy, great writer, deep reader, Will Schwalbe. Will Schwalbe, thank you for joining us from... Manhattan. How much, how much do you want to reveal about where in Manhattan you are, the isolation of your apartment? I, I'm fine with revealing. Hi, Michael, by the way. Thank you. Nice to, uh, nice to see you again. I'm bringing back lots of um, glorious mem- uh, memories of uh, being together in Nantucket uh, at the Book Festival. Uh, I live in the West Village, my husband and I, um, in the far West Village. So really right hard up against the Hudson River. All of us former New Yorkers are always curious to sort of look at the apartments and see what's how long have you lived in that apartment and what's your apartment story? How did you get that apartment? <laughs> Everyone has an apartment story. And I also call New York City the city of real estate regret because if you've been here for a couple of decades, you think, oh, I could have rented that or I could have bought that or that's rent control and I should have stayed there. And uh but uh, we have been in this marvelous building in the far west village since 1999. We started renting and uh, we fell in love with the building and very much wanted to stay here. And in 2001, uh, an apartment in our dream line became available. Uh, and uh, my aunt, who's a wonderful real estate broker, um, had been shoving things under doors uh, on, on every apartment in that line. And uh, one of the people wanted to sell, so uh, we, we bought the apartment. So we've been here now for 19 years in this apartment and 21 in the building. That's a great short story, the dream line. <laughs> the dream line, yes. <laughs> it's, uh, uh, everybody's dreams are shaped by their surroundings, I guess. <laughs> they, they are indeed. And we've been very, very happy here. Uh, Let me ask you, uh, to, to answer your favorite question, which is what are you reading? Yes, that is indeed my favorite question. So at the moment I'm reading Anna Karenina. I'm about two thirds of the way through. Uh, and uh, actually I had started Anna Karenina uh, last year. And I got to about page 300 and I just, I was enjoying it, but I I got to one of the sort of drier passages and I was interrupted by other things and I put it aside. And I'd always been very embarrassed by the fact that I hadn't read Anna Karenina. So I thought, okay, I'm shut in, locked down, separated from from humanity. Now is the perfect time to go back and, and finish Anna Karenina. You know, one of the reasons I wanted to tap into you, you're not at this, you were not scheduled for this summer's book festival, but you and I spoke a few years ago at one of the previous Nantucket book festivals. And there, I had a sense of urgency about talking to you because in this time of coronavirus, this pandemic, I have a sense of urgency to find and choose the right books for the right time, if there is such a thing. Is Anna Karenina the right book for the right time? And if not, what is? So I don't, I suppose if I really gave it a lot of thought, I perhaps could find some reasons um, why Anna Karenina is giving me strength and solace at at this moment. Um, And maybe it's just the enduring power of literature and a story so powerfully and beautifully told uh, that, that endures. Uh, through across continents and through revolutions and upheavals and world wars and everything. Uh, But I don't think, I think I might be stretching a little bit uh, on that. Uh, 
There's a book I read recently that uh, I love that spoke to me very deeply called Dear Edward by Anne Napolitano. Uh, and that's a book when people have been coming to me for recommendations of a book to read uh, during this time. That's, that's one that I have been recommending. Maybe you can just give us your little summary of Dear Edward and what, what questions it might have sparked for you. Well, Dear Edward, uh, and no, there's no spoiler here because uh, this is obvious from the flap copy and from the first pages, uh, is about a young boy, young kid who uh, is on a plane with his family uh, and the plane goes down and he is the sole survivor. Uh, and it's really about uh, how you get on with life uh, in the face of unspeakable tragedy. Um, and it's also about seeing tragedy uh, not simply in terms of numbers, but as an aggregation of individuals. Um, and, and in a very uh, moving way, you meet uh, many of the people uh, who were on the plane, uh, not just this little boy's family, um, but all sorts of people over the course of this novel. And you find out who they are and, and who they left behind. Uh, so if I had a question for her, uh, I mean, one is, does she see flying differently? Uh, she did a lot of research on uh, flight and, and what goes right and what can go wrong. But uh, much more than that, uh, I'm curious when she's in a, a crowd, something that seems a luxury these days of social, social isolation, but at some point um, we'll be back in crowds. Um, does she look around and imagine the lives of the people around her? Does she do that on a bus or in a theater, or on a train, in a plane, in a concert hall? Um, or does she only do that when she's wearing her novelist's hat? You know, this, this may not feel totally directly relevant, but, but I think it is, it, you, you had told me in our last conversation, you know, as you go around the country and you meet readers on your book tours, we are a tribe, you said. We are a tribe and we are a powerful tribe and we need to connect with one another in real life places. Like this, like this, and, but, but this is not quite real life. Yeah. Uh, but you write so much about just how books connect people because you, they can share their observations. In fact, your beautiful book about uh, the end of the, your beautiful book entitled The End of Your Life Book Club, the book club you had with your mother uh, for those, those final, did it turn out to be much longer than they anticipated after her it cancer took diagnosis? Three to six months and it turned out to be almost two years. So a, a diagnosis of you have three to six months to live. You started a book club. I remember the scene in, in the waiting room of Sloan Kettering. And that three to six month book club turned out, turned into two years of wonderful conversations about books. I just wonder if there's a bridge between somebody like Anne Napolitano, maybe changing her own perspective in a crowd at an airport, and then using that perspective changer to reach out to other people you might not have reached out to. Well, one of the fascinating things about this Anne Napolitano's novel, um, is that while you learn about some of the people who are on this airplane, uh, they don't learn the same things about each other. That you, the reader, have this privilege that the novelist has given you because she's shared their stories with you as reader. And there are some interactions uh, between and among them that take place on the plane. And again, I won't spoil anything, but they know very, very little about one another and most don't know anything. And, and that really is real life, that, that we sit in buses and trains and planes and concert halls um, with a dozen or sometimes hundreds of people who have rich and fascinating stories. Um, and a novelist could imagine those. Um, and they're all very real, but we don't get to find them out unless we make an effort, unless we start to bridge the distance. And, and one of the reasons I love the question, what are you reading so much, is it's a way to start to bridge the distance. It's a way to start to say, 
who are you and who do you want to become? Uh, and so to me that books, books are a way uh, not just to uh, find out about lives we wouldn't otherwise know about, but actually give us a bridge to connect with people in real life. I'm thinking maybe there's something actionable here because if we no longer take for granted the ability to be in a crowd with many other people, maybe the action item that we prepare for when we can be in crowds again is to just maybe, maybe make a point to get to know one person in that crowd, one stranger on a little bit of a deeper level. Yeah. I, I think it's, it's something when we do that, we're almost always rewarded. And there is the experience, and it's something that, that Dear Edward brought up for me. I'm sure we've all had that experience of you sit down on a plane, maybe for a longish plane ride. You have your book, or there's a movie you want to watch, or your earbuds. And the person next to you seems like she or he wants to talk, tries to start a conversation. And my initial reaction is almost always, ugh. Can't I just read my book in peace? Can't I watch my movie? Can't I just nap? And I often send out those signals, uh, the, the don't talk to me signals. But almost every time that I have put down my book, put away my earbuds, and turned to the person and in, made myself willing to talk, I, I've met someone with a story to tell or someone who another person who, who was an interesting person to meet. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, I think when we're allowed to uh, go back into the world, engage with one another, be in crowds small and large, uh, maybe one of the things we can stop do is stop isolating ourselves in public um, and make ourselves a little more available to people who want to engage with us we don't even have to, to initiate it ourselves most of the time. We just have to be receptive to it. There's a, there's a, there's a great expression that I came across in a Primo Levi book. In, in, it, in Yiddish, the, the translation is, a heavy heart talks a lot. Mm. And it's often those people with heavy hearts who really look like they want to talk. And if you just ask the one question, if you just start the conversation, you really make a connection. Yeah, yeah. And it's not always, I mean, I love that quote, but sometimes it's someone is delightful and funny and, and just has uh, interesting things they want to share or talk about or a perspective. Uh, I mean, every now and then, I'm sure um, we all wish we hadn't started a conversation with someone, but, but those, those occasions um, are thankfully few and far between. Coming back to your book, uh, The End of Your Life Book Club, I had a beautiful experience the other day with our son, one of three children, and uh, he is 19, a college freshman. Uh, so he's home for some virtual learning right now. And he said to me, you know, while he's home, he said, Dad, how would you like to start a book club, just the two of us? And I immediately thought to your two-person book club, but I thought, oh, this is heaven. And he knew it. Yeah. So now it's my turn to start making the recommendations. And given his interests, I know that Lyndon Johnson, LBJ, is one of the most fascinating historical political figures in American history. And Robert Caro's three volume monumental series would be so fantastic, but even a college student who is home studying is not gonna have time for that. But Caro has re recently wrote a book on his craft called, yes. called At Work. And I picked it up the other day and I said, oh my God, this is the book for my John because first it's, it's a story about how you approach writing but within that story are all these details about two of the most powerful men to ever exist. One LBJ on the national level, the one Carol focused on before LBJ was uh, Robert Moses mm. of New York, an unelected person who was probably one of the most powerful local figures ever in politics. 
And as Caro was describing how he got into writing, he told a story, and I want you to react to this. He told a story about when he was in college, and people always ask him now, it's, are you a very slow writer? Why are you such a slow writer? Because he only comes out with one of his books every five or 10 years or whatever it is. Why are you so slow? He said, well, I'm a very fast writer, very fast. And it reminded him of when he was in college and he was in a, a, a creative writing class that required students to produce one short story every two weeks. And he would save his for the last minute. He would pull an all nighter the night before and crank it out and got very good grades on it. So he's thinking, wow, my professor doesn't realize I'm just cranking this out. The professor knew what was going on. He loved Caro's writing, but he went up to Caro late in the semester and he said, you will not accomplish what you want to accomplish if you keep thinking with your fingers. What does that trigger for you? I think uh, that it's such an interesting story and it's such a powerful phrase. Um, I think it's very easy when you're writing to uh, have some quota that you want to make to say, I want to do 500 words. I want to do a thousand. I want to publish a novel before I'm 30. I want to publish a memoir before this and that. Um, and I think a certain amount of thinking needs to go on before the writing. Uh, that said, I'm also a huge uh, admirer of Anne Lamott. Um, and she has this philosophy about uh, just getting a draft down, no matter how crappy it is, you, you just have to get a, a draft down. So sometimes I do believe the prompt to the thinking can be your own writing. Uh, the difference between the two stories isn't a matter of process or technique. It's a matter of when you show it to someone else. So um, I think that if you're someone who needs to think deeply before you write, great. If you're someone who just needs to get it down on the page and think about it afterwards, great. But, but the thing that you really mustn't do is uh, have a quota, fill the quota and consider yourself done. I feel so liberated by, by that answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not a quote. I'm not a quota guy. Someone I admired greatly was David Halberstam, who had this incredible. I, I was lucky enough to edit his last couple books, uh, and he had an amazing ability to uh, wake up early, start writing, write till lunchtime, um, and then he'd go to lunch and make calls and sort of get on with his day in the afternoon. An absolute division of the day. Um, I love mentioning David, by the way, because David and Gene Halberstam uh, were longtime Nantucket residents um, and deeply, Gene deeply connected to the festival. So uh, it feels appropriate to uh, summon David uh, when, when doing the virtual Nantucket festival. That's, that's, and actually we, why, for those people who have not discovered, and many, so many have, David Halberstam's work, you just threw in that line, oh, I edited a couple of David Halberstam's book, books. I mean, you have really accomplished an enormous amount. I'm talking to you. You're an author. You're an editor. I know you've started businesses. You're a fascinating person to me. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. I feel the same about you. But, uh, but David Halberstam, again, in the spirit of introducing us to authors, uh, has he written anything that either you've edited or know of that, again, might be a good choice for this moment? Well, someone um, posed the question uh, on some form of social media, I think it may have been Twitter, what voice uh, is of someone who, who has died recently uh, would you most want and need at this moment? Sort of who, who could say things about this moment in history that would be of most meaning uh, for us right now? Um, and for me, the answer was instant. It was David Halberstam. Uh, starting with his work reporting the Vietnam War, he was always a truth teller. 
he did the, the legwork. He was a reporter first and a writer second. So he got the facts and facts cared, he cared about facts enormously. But more than anything else, a quality of David's mind and writing that, that we really need now is this idea of the connection between the lives of ordinary people and politics. And there are a lot of books written about what's going on in say the White House now and the advisors and their families and the corruption and that don't step back and show you the effect this has on ordinary people. And there are some wonderful books written about the lives of ordinary people that show the devastation these policies are wreaking on the lives of ordinary people, but don't then show you who is making the policies and the mechanics behind it. And, and David, in, in his last book, The Coldest Winter, for example, um, takes you into the, the mind and life of a soldier in the Korean War and into the mind and life of the people in Washington, the generals and politicians who were putting that soldier in harm's way. And, and I think what I miss now most, what I really would love to hear is someone who is a reporter, who is a truth teller, who brings all of that together. Hmm. Wow. Um, you know what, I, I I'm going to get this little clip out to my journalistic network because maybe somebody's poised. Or yeah. is and I don't, there are people, there's some, some marvelous people who, who are doing this. Um, so, so I don't want to say that no one's doing it. I always, I always try to shy away from sort of statements that are everybody's doing it or no one's doing that because those are not factual statements. But no one is doing it the way David Halberstam did it. Um, and I, that's, uh, I think most journalists that I know would, would say that is true, that there was a moral authority that was not editorializing, it was moral authority that David brought to his work. Well, thanks for raising that in, in the spirit of Nantucket and broader reasons as well. Um, you know, one of the things that occurs to me at the moment, uh, we're all thinking in some way or another about resilience. You know, where do we find the resilience for this time? And in our last interview, you had some beautiful thoughts on resilience. Resilience for me is a quality that you get amplified by someone else. It's one thing to be resilient alone, but if you can find someone else who is resilient, your resilience is far greater. I'm sorry, if you can find someone else who is resilient, who is resilient, your resilience is far greater than the sum of those two parts. That idea of of finding someone to be resilient with and becoming more resilient as a result. How do you do that long distance in the age of social isolation? Uh, I think that the answer for different people uh, will be different. I know some people uh, find that Twitter uh, amplifies their resilience. And there are movements that demonstrate this. Um, but it's, that's not for me. Um, for me, too many uh, little voices get in my head when I'm on Twitter and I, I, it, it's a rabbit hole and I lose my way. Uh, for me, when, when I'm feeling lacking in resilience and need to bolster mine, uh, it's, it's actually usually the telephone. Um, it's not Zoom, it's not video chats, it's not FaceTime. And, and that may be because I grew up in a generation where there were only three options. You were either with someone in person, you sent them a letter, or you were on the phone with them. Uh, so in, in the heat of the moment for me, hearing someone else's voice but being able to kind of sit quietly with myself bolsters my resilience. Uh, I, I do think too, there's something to letters. There's something to someone taking the time to put thoughts on words and, and mail them to you. Uh, and now that our uh, United States post office is under threat, uh, I think it's worth remembering that 
the letter sent in the mail, the letter of encouragement, uh, the letter of condolence, the letter of friendship, where someone bothered to take a piece of paper and write words on it and put it in an envelope and put a stamp on it and send it off to be mailed is still a really powerful thing that I, that I hope we never lose. Uh, think what you want to say be, before you say it. And we've all had the experience of the letter you write and rip up and do drafts. Um, the thing that you send, it's a very purposeful, you, you don't send a letter by accident. Um, you send a letter on purpose. Uh, one of the books that I wrote about uh, in my last book, Books for Living, was a book called A Journey Around My Room by Xavier de Maistre. My French pronunciation is terrible, so I'm sure I'm butchering that. Who was, it was written in the 1780s, and he was a French count who was scheduled to 42 days house arrest uh, for the crime of dueling. Um, and it was before ankle bracelets, so they just trusted him to stay in his room for 42 days. And he wrote a travel book about his room. Uh, and he journeyed to all the different corners of his room and he wrote this travel book. Um, and, and it's quite charming and digressive, but it gets to be very moving. Um, and one of the most moving passages is he decides one day to visit his correspondence, the letters that his best friend had written him. And this is a friend who had died in his arms of a plague, of a, of a disease, while they were soldiers together on a foreign campaign. And I thought about visiting the letters and and especially in times of isolation like this the comfort that that provides and i under totally understand the nursing home not letting letters in um in this time it makes sense but i do think that when we can go back to letters i hope we do because it's not it's not just the pur purposefulness it's touch that someone touched that object and sent it to you. And for me, that, that's sort of like the first edition of a book that's signed by the author. I mean, why, why would that matter? Uh, why is that better than an uh, ebook? A and the answer is, it's a physical object that you can visit, that you can hold in your hands. And there's just something marvelous that that author touched it, that there's a, a physical connection. And I think, we're going to be craving more and more that kind of physical connection. Everything you say, I want to create a SWAT team to make it happen. And I really, let's put our heads together right now. Can we create some kind of a physical pen to paper letter writing campaign to some end that would serve the purpose of, of and have the impact that you say physical letters have? Is there something maybe in the Nantucket Book Festival community that we could do? And maybe, by the way, we are, our umbrella organization is the Nantucket Book Foundation. So we are not just about putting on a festival. Uh, the foundation does a lot of work in the schools. Uh, Nantucket, which has a reputation as being a playground for the rich, is a very much a microcosm of America. There is a large swath of low-income people here, uh, immigrants, uh, uh, many of them, and they, you know, they are served by our Nantucket Book Foundation programs, and we bring authors into the schools very much. What a wonderful thing, maybe, to get them to write letters. Here's the question, about what and to what end? Who should we get people to write letters about and to whom? Well, so it's such, I love that, that we're going to brainstorm this. Uh, I should mention just a brief story. Uh, I had the uh, great privilege of working for three years with a wonderful writer, although she was just a college grad at the time. She was not yet a writer named Emily Gould. Um, and she wrote a book of autobiographical essays called And the Heart Says Whatever. She wrote a novel called Friendship. And her new novel called Perfect Tunes is actually coming out April uh, this month. Uh, and uh, it's, it's an extraordinary uh, book about... Uh, a mother and a daughter and uh, about uh, sort of uh, what we pass on from one generation to the next and the mistakes that we make again and, and, and the different ones we make. And, and our, our main character in this book is a songwriter uh, and whose creative ambitions are, have to be put on hold as she becomes a single mother and raises a child. Uh, 
that's the background on, on Perfect Tunes. And it's a book I, I highly recommend. But I was talking to Emily, actually, for my podcast, but that's another story. And she told about a book that she bought. And she bought it secondhand. And out tumbled a letter. And I'm trying to remember, it was either to the author or from the author. So this had clearly been a copy that had interacted with the author at some point. Um, and maybe what we should be doing is leaving letters in books. Uh, and in fact, giving to wonderful independent bookstores letters to place in books um, if they want. And I know that could be dangerous, so we have to think this through a little bit. I love this idea. We have to get, by the way, keep on going, keep on going. So that maybe um, when you walk into Mitchell's bookstore and you buy a copy of Dear Edward, um, maybe maybe the, the bookseller has, has placed a letter in there from the, someone who read Dear Edward, who has written a letter for the next reader of it. Uh, and uh, I think, um, and authors could write uh, little notes, not for readers of their book, because they've said what they have to say, but for readers of other books. I mean, I'd love to leave a letter uh, in Emily Gould's Perfect Tunes in a new copy of it that an indie bookseller sold for the next person who finds it. By the way, you mentioned you have a podcast, which I didn't know. How can we find it and what's the angle? So the podcast is called, But That's Another Story. And I talk to uh, people I admire, mostly writers, about a book that changed their life. Um, we've had more than 50 wonderful episodes. The podcast is actually going into hiatus um, for, for a while. So, uh, uh, But there are still 50 plus episodes that people can listen to. And it's everybody from um, Min Jin Lee, author of Pachinko, to um, Melinda Gates and Jodie Foster, um, Simrat Singh, wonderful author and uh, rights activist. Um, it's, it's been a, a great privilege. And coming up on the last couple of episodes, um, uh, Jennifer Finney Boylan uh, is going to be talking about uh, Tolkien and her new book called Good Boy. Uh, Emily Gould is on it talking about uh, Perfect Tunes. And an extraordinary author, also another extraordinary author, uh, Rufy Thorpe, who has a new book out called The Knockout Queen. Um, and uh, she talks about Jane Smiley. So it's called But That's Another Story. And uh, I do hope people will find their way to it. Well, again, you're so great at putting the spotlight with your own context on other books. And you mentioned uh, Jennifer Finney Boyle. I know I read her work in certainly in the New York Times um, on the op-ed page. Uh, Min Jin Lee, who only because of, the, of her appearance at the Nantucket Book Festival, am I familiar with this great, great author who probably gave one of the best opening night presentations at the Nantucket Book Festival a couple of years ago. I just totally riveting. I'm fascinated by her. And uh, well, you talk about somebody who is resilient. Uh, is there something you can channel uh, from her to us during this time? Well, Min is resilient. Uh, Min is a student of history. She's a marvelous novelist, but also, um, she, uh, you know, one of the things that, that I got from that book is not just how moved I was to read it and how those characters entered my life, but also uh, she encouraged me to dive much deeper into um, the uh, situation for uh, Koreans whose families had emigrated to Japan decades, generations ago, um, and what life can be like for them even, even to this day. So I think, you know, channeling Min, uh, again, uh, history and literature hand in hand, just as you're talking about with your son and, and your reading group. But when I think of Min, uh, and I adore her, one of the things about her is she is the consummate literary citizen. She supports other writers. She supports booksellers. She's always giving shout outs to all different people in the community. Uh, and, and we need each other's support. Uh, there are books that authors labored on for years, decades, that are coming out right in the midst of this pandemic with the uh, independent bookstores um, filling valiantly, but, but unable to allow people to browse with the media so consumed that uh, 
there's no room for anything else. So I think now more than ever to channel uh, men's literary citizenship uh, and support one another, book indie booksellers, authors, reviewers who um, may not have newspapers to return to, um, or just the entire community festivals, the Nantucket Book Festival, um, to support that kind of amazing cultural institution. That's what I get from men. I am going to Google literary citizenship. I've never heard that term. I want to see if what pops up. Here's mm -hmm. one definition from somebody. Literary citizenship is a two-way street. It means being part of a community. It means not only writing, but also reading the work of others. Most, most of all, it means being there for others. Uh, but in any event, you, you have this definition of literary citizenship, which actually is sort of a, a great framework uh, for the Nantucket Book Festival's mission, uh, because that is in part, yeah. in large measure, what we're about. It's very much what the book festival is about. And book festivals, um, they, they sort of embody literary citizenship. They're, they support readers, they support booksellers, they support writers, um, and uh, they support libraries and involve them. They uh, almost always have programs for children. Um, they involve seniors. I mean, they're, uh, they're key cultural assets and they're the embodiment of literary citizenship. Will Schwabe, you are, I think you are the consummate literary citizen because not only do you not only do you meet all the criteria but you're such an engaging storyteller and a good person to boot so thank you so much it was, it was it's always great talking to you and particularly great to have you uh, at the nantucket book festival's special online series at home with authors Thank you, Michael. I feel the same way about you as a uh, consummate literary citizen. And uh, I just wanted to end by saying that even though my body is uh, sheltering in place in my apartment in Greenwich Village, my heart is at the Nantucket Book Festival um, and uh, can't wait to uh, return my body there at some point in the not too distant future. <laughs> <laughs>